Hello folks, this is David Hurley of EasyChessTips.com, the pub chess bluffer, reporting on the second day of action in the under 1750 uh, afternoon competition, a minor tournament consisting of five games um, as part of the 2018 British Chess Championships that are being held here in Hull uh, in uh, July and August of this year. Uh, I was up against a 13-year-old Sussex junior player, an experienced club player, in spite of her uh, young years, uh, Paulina Shepinova, uh, a rather fetching 13-year-old who was uh, very friendly before the game. But as soon as the game was over, she dashed off with some fellow who was waiting in the wings for her, not giving the poor old chess pub bluffer or pub chess bluffer a chance to go through post-game analysis, which is the usual and polite thing to do with your opponent. But what can you expect from the younger generation these days, eh? Anyway, this is how the game played out. I was white and I led with d4 as usual. She responded with knight to f6. And against that, I play c4. And she came up with uh, g6, looking for the bishop here on g7 to aim down this uh, long diagonal here. I continued with knight to c3, and she opened up with uh, d5. I then took d5, and she took back with the knight. Now, I'm used to this in a slightly different opening uh, called uh, the Queen's Gambit Declined, um, where this pawn, it happens one move earlier, this pawn is not yet out. Um, and in that, in that situation, I do what the computer is recommending here, and I did it also here. I advance my uh, e-pawn to attack the knight and in most cases, the knight will then take uh, my knight on c3. In some cases, it retreats back here, but this is considered the better move. And I then take, and the idea is that white has now built a central majority. This happened. I was feeling quite pleased with this. Um, then uh, my opponent placed her bishop on g7, and we are in... Uh, I didn't know at the time, because I'm unfamiliar with this opening, but it is a very effective uh, defense by black, and it's called the Grunfeldt defense. And uh, my go-to when I'm playing white, my go-to writer um, in the Queen's openings, uh, John Watson, he describes the Grunfeldt defense as one of the leading defenses versus my opening 1d4, and used by high-level players everywhere. Today, it is at the peak of its popularity, so it's something I should become familiar with. And none of the main lines appear to be achieving an advantage against it, so it's a very good defense. That makes it all the more appropriate, he says, for to propose a response or responses which are not the best known, but at the same time challenging and complex enough to be rewarding to the player who understands them well. And... Uh, my response was actually a mainline response. Uh, I'm still I'm still within a standard opening play here. Um, my response was knight to f3. <clears throat> but um, John Watson's comment is that um, knight to f3. Where is it? is that knight to f3 is one of the um, more common responses and that there's a lot of literature about this particular uh, response to bishop to g7, which means that it's a well-traveled um, well traveled part of, of the response to the Grunfeld um, defense. And what he recommends instead is um, bishop to uh, g5, which pins the uh, king's pawn. If the pawn advances now, the queen will fall, and that will be pretty much game over. Uh, it also 
frees up this square, <clears throat> excuse me, for this rook to defend this pawn. Um, this pawn is actually quite weak, it's undefended. The rook can come in here and defend this pawn, which then frees up. I discovered um, I became quite, um, I, I had some problems in res trying to resolve how to defend while maintaining a central majority. Um, so this is an opening that I will now be studying, the Grunfeld, um, the Grunfeld defense and White's response um, with uh, the seventh move, bishop to g5. That is not what I did in yesterday's game. I, was, um, I, have, I have read and probably even taken notes about this opening, but uh, until you actually have to play them over the board, uh, they don't tend to stick, at least in my old noddle. So one of the benefits of playing in this competition is that when I'm confronted by players who know these openings, um, I have to, after the game, I go home and I analyze what happened. Um, and that really helps to uh, hammer at least one version of the opening into my, into my brain. Hard earned experience seems to be helping. So, um, the response then, after I move knight to uh, f3, is indeed uh, c5, attacking down here. Now, um, when I'm playing black, my response to any opening other than uh, pawn to e4 is to use Charlie Story, my, my chess friend Charlie Story's um, sniper. And this setup here actually resembles the sniper, though though um, the move order is different and the queen's pawn has already disappeared. Um, but this c5 attack on the d4 pawn, in this situation here, it is actually very effective. If I were to take here with my uh, d pawn, like so, then the queen could be taken, or this pawn here is now uh, open to be taken with check. So you have to think carefully about what to do in this situation. Uh, I did not take that pawn. Instead, I uh, attempted to shore up my, my, my center. Well, actually what I did next was a developing move. Um, bishop to e2, getting ready to castle. Um, that was followed by knight indeed to b6. And then I put my bishop into e3, uh, adding an extra layer of defense. Because you can see what's happening is more and more pressure is being piled on this uh, d4 pawn here. We have the knight attacking here. Oops. Um, where are we? We have the knight attacking. We have the pawn attacking. We have the bishop attacking. We have the queen attacking. That is four pieces um, attacking d4. And I have at the moment one, two, three, four pieces defending d4, at which point um, a very good move comes in by black, and that is, um, where is it? Black played, knight b6. Ah, at black, before doing that, black castled. I then also castled, so king safety. Um, one of Charlie Story's top recommendations in his list of things to consider, uh, right at number one, is uh, king safety. So we both placed our kings, we castled, our kings are in their fortresses. And then, indeed, she leads with the attack. Now, c takes d4, c takes d4, and then bang, in comes this bishop. Now what it's doing is threatening to take away one of the defenders of d4. We now, with that exchange, we now have her knight, her queen, and her bishop attacking d4. We have my bishop, my knight, and my queen. What did I say? With bishop to, with bishop to g4, she's threatening to take away um, the knight who is defending uh, the d4 pawn. At present, we have her knight, her bishop, and her queen attacking d4, and my bishop, my knight, and my queen defending d4. Um, if, she, if this exchange takes place here, um, bishop takes knight, if that happens on her turn, 
if I do something else, like I move up this pawn, for example, she takes bishop, she takes my knight with her bishop. Then if I take um, her bishop with my bishop, she will win a piece down here or a pawn. Let me show you. Let's go crazy and do something like this. She takes here. I take here. She takes here. Uh, come here. She takes here. If I take here, she can take straight down there, bang, with her queen. And it's looking like quite a strong position. That's actually equal, isn't it? In this situation, two, four, six, three, four, five. She has a one pawn advantage and a nicely placed central knight there. So as you can see, black gains um, a small but significant advantage here, according to the engine. But uh, that is a nice position for black to be in. A one pawn advantage. She has a majority over here. Um, and that will be used to effect later in the game so to prevent that let's go back to let's go back to bishop to g4 she brought in bishop to g4 now i made one of my best moves of this game um, one other danger uh, that white faces with this uh, g7 bishop eyeing it, the g7 bishop is eyeing my rook so i moved it to b1 now a rook on b1 is hitting this uh, b7 pawn and black has to think uh, carefully about whether to press on with uh, black's own goals which is to remove this knight from as a defender of d4 or whether to um, take one move to do something about this threat here now, the uh, computer is recommending that she presses ahead with her own agenda, which incidentally is what, uh, what Jeremy Silman would almost certainly recommend. Um, chess is partly a contest of agendas, whose agenda is going to dominate. And in this part of the game, um, she responds like so. And this creates a weakness because her queen, now I was not aware of this during the game, I hasten to add, uh, I got some very good post-game analysis from a much higher level player who was doing some commentary on his own game. And then after that, he and I um, went off and looked at uh, some of his games and also at this game here. And he offered me some very good uh, insight on uh, what happened in this game and how I could have prevented it with a higher level of play. Um, this pawn here on b6 prevents the queen. It restricts the queen from coming out here to these, these uh, and getting some freedom over here. Um, however, I did not take advantage of the situation, the opportunity that I had created. Um, so uh, what happened? I played, I played rook to b1, she played b6. I then advanced my pawn to d5. <clears throat> and the engine is recommending that the knight goes over here, but she moved her knight to e5. Um, you can see this position is giving me an advantage, uh, according to the engine. But I somehow managed to lose this advantage, even while thinking I was building a reasonably good center. Now, the chess engine recommends that I move my knight over here, and at this point in the game, I completely forgot some very good advice I've received, both on uh, Monday evening in an intensive um, bit of coaching from Charlie's story, and also on uh, Monday lunchtime when I popped into the commentary room. Um, we went over, he, he very briefly went over some of the points that uh, he had um, taught me on the Monday evening. And one of the key points is not to exchange, do not initiate exchanges unless you have a very good reason to do so. Um, I mentioned this while analyzing this game with, um, with uh, my new friend last night, whose name I actually don't, don't know. Um, 
And he also said uh, in, uh, in Russian training, uh, exchanging for no particular reason is never recommended. I forgot all of that good advice because it hasn't yet sunk into the point where it becomes um, a natural consideration. Um, incidentally, that would be one of, one of Jeremy Silman's imbalances also. Uh, the very first one is looking at um, minority, look, sorry, looking at the minor pieces, the knights and the bishops, <clears throat> and uh, who, has, who has the better position with them. Just exchanging them off is going to lead to, um, uh, or is very likely to lead to a disadvantageous uh, position for the initiator of the exchange. So I completely forgot that. You can see the machine is not recommending an exchange here. It's recommending that I move my knight forward um, to here. And then there'll be a bishop exchange, but the central position remains quite solid. I did not do that. So let's go back to, um, let's go back. So the engine is recommending knight to uh, d4 and um, certainly not recommending an exchange. I forgot all the advice I'd been given and I uh, exchanged. Knight takes e5. And then the exchange proceeds. Bishop takes e2. Um, queen takes e2. The bishop hits the knight. Now, the reason I, there was actually a reason I now remember why I initiated the exchange, but I don't think it's a good enough reason. So this is a nice recommendation here, um, getting the bishop up there. So later in the game, I was trying to find a better square for this bishop. Perhaps if I sent him up there earlier in the game, things may have turned out differently. But I didn't. I attacked, I attacked um, the center here to knock this bishop back. The bishop simply retreats back there. And then I went rook b to d, rook b to um, d1. I put my rook behind this pawn here. And indeed, she moved her rook out to the open file. So the engine is still giving white a slight advantage, which is nice, and recommending that we begin advancing our pawns in the center, which was certainly my aim. Mm. So rook c8, e5, I indeed advanced uh, e5, like so. Um, Hemming in the bishop, that's part of the aim, and moving moving forward, gaining space, and threatening with a longer term aim of um, either advantageously trading them off or even promoting the pawns um, up there on the eighth, uh, eighth rank. So e5. Now she answered with, I think, a pretty good move, um, which was f6. Okay, the engine doesn't seem to think it's particularly great, though it's only a slight advantage to white. Further thought reduces the advantage. Um, F6, I thought F6 was a pretty good move. Now, I should have stayed focused on the pawns. I'm concerned with this bishop. I want to bring the bishop in, um, into play. And my idea is to bring it down here and then to support from here. But uh, in moving my bishop, I think probably, I, I don't think the engine will like this move very much, but I moved my bishop back and indeed hand over a very small advantage to, to well, maybe not, we're about equal. Anyway, I moved my bishop back here. So the queen now adds support to this pawn and I'm looking for a better square for my bishop. Anyway, uh, she then indeed attacks down here. F takes e5. F takes e5. And this gives her the rook down here. Now, um, why is the king being recommended to take? Why, why is the engine recommending that I take the rook with the king and not with the rook or the queen? For the simple reason, and this is where the weakness in my play in the last couple of moves is revealed. Um, 
if I take with this rook, the queen wins this pawn. If I take with the queen, the bishop wins this pawn. Um, seeing that, I took here and um, king takes f1. And then she played a very good move, actually, perhaps even better than what is being recommended here. She brought her rook down here to um, c5. Now, according to the machine, technically, this is still advantage white. However, um, I must... Uh, Technically, it is still advantage white. It's recommending the continued advance of the pawn following with the theme of advancing these central pawns. The whole aim of white's game has been to build up this central um, majority of pawns and then to press forward with them. Um, and up until now, I had been doing that. So when she played rook to c5, I played, instead of continuing with the advance, I played queen to e Four. Okay, now it's still giving us equality, but uh, things were beginning to go a bit haywire here because she found another very good move, e6. e6, now there's a double attack, uh, sorry, a treble attack on this pawn, and it's only defended by two pieces. Um, recommending queen... I didn't play this move here, looking at if the pawn takes and we come in here with check. I played queen to f3, and probably that's going to give black a big advantage. This is perhaps my worst move of the game. Um, I'm looking at this target square here while trying to maintain defense. I've basically given up the center. This is a loser's move. This is, um, this is not good chess. So queen to f3 is a blunder or a mistake. Um, rook now can take d5. Um, I then continued with the exchange, but it recommends going over here to prop up this pawn. But uh, I went ahead with the exchange. Um, rook takes d5. Queen takes d5. Queen takes d5. Pawn takes d5, and it's advantage black. Um, now, I should have pressed ahead here. I was looking at it, but I felt that, the, that I, it was very difficult to support this pawn. The king would come here. I guess what I should have done... Uh, sorry, the, if, I, if I move the pawn forward, as the engine is recommending, the king comes here. What I didn't, what I didn't realize in the game, and we'll come back to how I was moving. I mean, the time I was taking to move, I could have come in here with this bishop to go check. Let's have a look. Okay, he's recommended going up there. I could have come in with the bishop as check. The king gets on that square, but at least I can. I, I perhaps I don't. I don't need to move this pawn forward because we have a we have a white, we have a. A black squared bishop unable to attack this white pawn, which is advanced. It's still a big advantage here to black, but somehow this combination looks better than what I actually played. So here, um, when e took d5, e takes d5, where are we? e takes d5, what, what number is that? But instead of advancing my pawn, I attempted to shore it up with this rather weak move here. Um, bishop to bishop to f4. The king then advances. My king advances. King continues the advance. And now there are two pieces attacking my my pawn because I failed to advance that pawn. So this is a grave error here. You can see in this stage of the game, I made several um, foolish moves. Um, I I was talking to um, last year's, my chess coach from last year, Paul Robson, about uh, playing games with juniors. 
with these accomplished juniors with a lot of experience. Um, and I said, well, one mistake I've been making is that I've been playing at the speed of juniors. You know, they'll bang out a move. Uh, even when they're thinking, they won't think for more than three or four minutes, and then they bung in a move. And I was playing at a similar tempo. Uh, my regular, my twice monthly games uh, that I play with a private student of mine after our class, uh, we set the clock at 30 minutes each with no increment. And I'm used to playing at that speed where you bang out your moves quickly in the beginning if you know you're opening um, to save time that you can use to spend uh, to think in the middle of, in the middle game. Um, and, and thinking time then is rarely more than 10 minutes. But in these games, what I haven't been using is my time resource. Um, I haven't been using it very wisely. I've been playing at this higher speed tempo when I have plenty of time on the clock. And one weapon I think uh, the old guys like me have against the youngsters is um, the use of time. Youngsters, I suspect, are impatient. They're eager. Think of Juliet's exchange with the nurse in Romeo and Juliet, where she complains about how slow the nurse and old people in general are. Well, I think... Uh, Next time I play a junior, I'm going to slow my game right down. I'm going to do a lot more thinking and watch them wriggle while I delay making any kind of move at all. Perhaps I'll get impatient and bang out um, an ill-considered move rather too hastily. That at least is my, my hope uh, in coping with more experienced younger players in the future. Today, I happen to be playing um, a guy a few years older than myself. Um, I'll be playing black in that game. So uh, time considerations, though I will slow down my play, may not be, um, be of, as, of such, uh, such moment. So anyway, here we are um, with black now placing pressure on this pawn because of my failure to advance it a couple of moves ago uh, by bringing his king to uh, e6. Where is that move? King to e6. Okay, I then moved uh, g4, um, thinking I want to stop the king advancing through, but all that happens is there's another exchange that is not in my favor. My center is now completely destroyed, and we see that black has now the central majority and is advancing um, towards uh, my territory down here. Um, yeah, it's a lost game. This is a lost game for white already. Um, but I played on for a few moves. You never know what might happen. Actually, you do know when you're playing against these um, club juniors at this stage in the game, they're going to win. Um, so where are we? Bishop takes e5, uh, king takes e5, king to e3, an attempt to um, maintain the opposition, this position is called, but uh, with this pawn next to the king, there's nothing for black to worry about here. Um, d4 check. Uh, the engine is recommending my king moves, moves down there. Where did I go? Uh, king to d3, desperately trying to stop any further advance, though failing to do so. b5, a3. This is a lost game now. a5. It's a very lost game. My one hope is that I might be able to, to induce stalemate. So I'm playing on to see if I can uh, get, get a stalemate position. This is a forlorn hope, but when that's all you have, that's what you have to go for. In this position, ah, now, yeah, I moved my king down here. Um, king to c2. Is there any chance of a stalemate here? King to e4. Let's get into a position where only my king can move. G. Wait a minute, where are we here? King to e4. King to c2. H5. Sorry, let's undo that. I moved the wrong pawn. So I'm trying to induce either um, pawn stuck here. So that the only thing that can move is my king. And I'm hoping to be in a position where my king is not in check and cannot move to bring a, to grab a stalemate draw from the jaws of defeat. The ch pub chess bluffer is playing his last card, and it's uh, two of diamonds. 
here we go. Uh, H5, H5. G takes H. I was quite happy to see that because I move in here. I take that pawn. Uh, king comes down to E3. I put that in place. Now I'm just hoping for a stalemate trap. Um, a6, d3, d3, king to d1, b3. I'm looking around. Where can the king go? c1. Is there any possibility? She moves her king down here. Okay, I'm not in check, but unfortunately, I can still move king to b2. She comes in with d2. At this point, um, the king has plenty of op moving options, so stalemate is not going to happen. At this point, I thought uh, I would play, uh, what's it called? Discretion is the better part of value, and I would resign. So I resigned. This game uh, just took barely an hour to play out. Um, as, soon as, as soon as I had won, she hopped up her brother or boyfriend or somebody was waiting for and they zoomed off. I've never seen anybody zoom off from a game so quickly. There was no prospect of post-game analysis with Miss uh, Poly Polita, or was it Polivia? Um, anyway, I came home with my tails be tail between my legs and then I uh, studied the, I discovered by reading John Watson what went wrong that uh, I had been involved with the Grunfeld defense. Um, again, one of the benefits of uh, facing these uh, uh, experienced junior players for a pub chess bluffer such as myself is that you quickly learn um, uh, opening theory. So I now have under my belt a bit more knowledge of a fine black defense called the Grunfeld uh, defense. Now, all is not doom and gloom. I'm having a fine time here, learning a lot about chess. Um, and while I'm losing on the board, I'm picking up a few minor victories here and there. Um, here's one. I, I won this badge as an entry, an entry level prize, according to commentator Charlie Story, uh, because I predicted correctly um, the next move in um, the end game of uh, one of the uh, top games on the top board of the main British Chess Championship between uh, Adams and I forget the name of his opponent, but uh, Adams is one of the top players. Um, I think he's half a point behind uh, whoever it is who's leading the championships. Uh, so I predicted his move and won myself a badge. There you go. So, and then perhaps more importantly, um, some good advice from my chess coach, uh, Paul Robson. Uh, he said to me, Dave, um, the Hull Chess uh, Club are giving away uh, tickets for free beers uh, for an event on Wednesday night. Um, uh, a Hull-based brewery has created a Grand Master Ale and they're giving away 100 free pints. And he said, I went and I got a ticket for me and two tickets for uh, uh, my friends. These are my friends who are attending. Uh, I don't know that uh, those tickets will ever be given away to friends. I suspect somebody is going to enjoy three free pints tonight. Anyway, I've got myself one free pint of Grandmaster Ale. I'm going to pop up to the chess, uh, to the hull Hull Chess Club desk today and see if I can blag another one or two uh, tickets for that event because I don't think 100 people are going to go. Uh, so that's one thing that's going on. Uh, last night we had a nice uh, tour of Old Hull, ye olde pubs of Oldie Hull, uh, drinking half pints in each of the pub uh, to try the different beers. And there's a lot of interesting pubs in Hull. Hull, uh, I'm, I'm kind of falling in love with Hull. At first, I wasn't sure that I would like the place very much. It had been bombed to buggery in the last war, and so uh, much of the city centre is um, it has been rebuilt post-war. But in fact, in Old Hull, there is a lot of good old stuff there, and also Hull Minster is a beautiful, beautiful church in the square. And Hull was the uh, international city of culture last year, I think, 
and so a lot of a lot of um, a lot of uh, architectural improvements have been um, put in place. And there's a lot of waterworks, fountains, and things like that, which make it actually a very pleasant city. I'm I'm having a having a having a ball up here in Hull. Um, yeah, it's it's a good experience. Uh, losing to juniors is not a problem if I'm learning stuff to hone the pub chess bluffers um, beer chess skills. So anyway, that's all for me today. Uh, today I'm playing um, an, a, an adult, my first adult uh, opponent in this week of chess. Uh, I'll be playing black, so I'll either be playing the French defense if he opens with e4, or I'll be playing Charlie Story's sniper defense uh, against any other opening. So let's see what today brings. Whatever happens, I get free beer in the evening. So that's all for now from me, David Hurley of EasyChessTips.com, your pub chess bluffer.